Well, we were able to go to NFL Honors last night, and of course, at night, I was at the pregame show. The actual game, we have the MVP, Patrick Mahomes, surprise to very few. Uh, we also have Coach of the Year, Brian Dable, uh, the New York Giants. If you told me that in the beginning of the year, I, everyone had hopes but uh, as a Giant fan, but nobody thought they were going to turn around, make the playoffs, let alone win a game. With me right now is a guy that's gone from uh, player to coach. Oh, by the way, stepped into the Hall of Fame and then said, let me try broadcasting. <laughs> And has been surging ever since. Uh, Tony Dungy, Coach, welcome welcome back to the show. Thanks hey, so much for being thank here. Thank you, Brian. It's always great to be with you. You know what I love? I feel like it's back. I mean, we want to turn the page on the pandemic, but when the Super Bowl came even last year, it wasn't the same. And then two years ago, there was no fans, yeah. period. Actually, I had Tampa playing at home, and you couldn't even tell they were at home. <laughs> And now I feel like it's back. This place is the fourth Super Bowl they're holding it. What do you sense is walking around town? It is different. Uh, last year we broadcast the game for NBC. You kind of felt like it was back, but uh, it still wasn't all the way there. I came in last night. There must have been 10,000 people at the airport at 10 o'clock. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's crowded, and you say this is the way it used to be. I mean, yeah. Steelers have great fans. I get it. But. Eagles. The Eagles, <laughs> my goodness. I'm telling you. And oh, Chiefs, too. Everywhere. I mean, yep. Chiefs a little bit more yeah. docile. They're, yeah. they're great volume, but they're more polite. Yeah. Eagles fans are not polite. Well, they are out <laughs> there, both both sides, and it's, it's going to be a great atmosphere. It really is. So, uh, for me in particular, I had a chance to talk to, for the first time, Mel Blunt. So you, Mel you, Blunt was the first man I met in the National Football League. Are you League. kidding? I'm coming into Pittsburgh as a free agent. They send me a ticket, get on the plane. Uh, this guy meets me out at the airport, says, go down to the William Penn Hotel and check in this? there. This is 1977. And I'm walking around the hotel looking for what's the next thing I'm supposed to do. I see this guy. He looks like he's seven feet tall. He's got cowboy he's boots, cowboy hat on. He shakes my hand. He says, I'm Mel Blunt. I said, if this is <laughs> professional football this is what cornerbacks look like i don't know if i can play but i mean he's big he's big big for he, today he, oh he could I mean, play yeah. right now six five just it looks like he's chiseled out of a mountain see we all knew your team like the giants in and jets in new york weren't making the playoffs for 10 years 12 years so when the playoffs started it was like a brand new uh it was a brand new season so you watch the, the vikings every year and you watch the Steelers, yeah. you watch the raiders and everybody knew your whole team because no more no free agents nobody yep. moved yep I'm surprised at, I look at Lambert. He was like 210, 220. You know, Jack Ham looked like 210, 220. Would that transfer today's game? It, it would. It would. Those guys would have been great players in this game. Guys are bigger now. Uh, you know, the weightlifting. And Alan Page was 220 yeah. as a defensive no, lineman. It, yeah, there were guys who were, were smaller. Uh, but I'm telling you, those guys would have translated over uh, in, in this era just as well. We had, uh, I got there, and I was the same way as you, Brian. I'm watching high school, I'm seeing Franco Harris and Immaculate Reception, and then five years later, here I'm in training camp, and it's all these Hall of Famers that are going to go in the Hall of Fame. Lynn Swan, John Stallworth, Terry Bradshaw, Franco Harris, Mel Blunt, Joe Green, on and on and on and on. And I said, boy, if I make this team, I got a good chance. We're going to win because these guys are right. great, boy. And you did, but Chuck Knowles saw a coach in you too, right? Yeah, he really did. He called me. Uh, I played there two years, and then I got traded to the 49ers, played a year for Bill Walsh, and it was fantastic. Uh, but then uh, I got traded again, cut. Now I'm just kind of that guy who's done at 25 years old. Um, and Coach Noel called me, and he said, I, I love the way you approach the game. You've got great communication skills. I think you could be a good coach if you're interested. And he hired me as a 25-year-old with no experience. And I think the first time I remember hearing about you, you were about 34, and people were like, you got to look at this guy in Pittsburgh. This guy could be a head coach. And it was years after. You had to wait a long time. How many interviews before you got the job? I actually Tampa? only had four or five interviews. Uh, but Maybe I, that's the problem, too. <laughs> I uh, became the defensive coordinator at 28, and uh, Coach Noel, you know, trained me. And I, I saw, you know, work for him, uh, work for the best in the business, and then uh, went to Kansas City, worked three years for Marty Schottenheimer. Then I worked four more years for Denny Green. So I had been around some really, really good people and uh, finally got the job in Tampa. So when back in those days, were you the Bud Grant type that when the season ends, I go hunting, I'll see you when the season starts? Or were you someone sleeping in the office? No, I wasn't a sleep in the office guy. Coach Noel, the, my very first meeting with the Steelers as a rookie, Coach Noel said, welcome to the National Football League. You're now getting paid to play football. So that makes it your profession. 
but don't make football your life. That was his first words to us. That's so interesting. And I was expecting just the opposite. Man, these guys have won Super Bowls. He's going to tell me you got to be more dedicated. you got to pour into it. He said, do not make football your life. You have to find a purpose away from the field. And he lived that out for us. And when I worked for him for 10 years as an assistant coach, hey, we're going to work hard. We're going to get it done. But we're going to have family life. We're going to do things the right way. You're going to be a part of the community. And I saw him do it and do it successfully. So when I went to Tampa as a head coach, we had family Saturdays, just like we had in uh, Pittsburgh, where you bring your kids to practice, and that's just the way you do things. And I went to Indianapolis, and I said, hey, kids are going to be in the building. They had never had kids in the building before. Uh, so, no, I was not one of those who lived and died and breathed and stayed in the office. I thought after the pandemic when so many coaches were told to go home and, like, deconflict and do the draft from your house and you don't have to go to work, I thought that that might be a recalibration on maybe we want to redo how we, how we uh, siphon out work. Well, you have to have a little courage to do that because everybody's going to look and say, oh, you're not there 24-7, and if you don't win – then that's going to be the reason. You're not dedicated enough. And I heard that a little bit the first part of my career in, in Tampa. We're winning, but maybe not winning as much as people think. Oh, if you took it a little more seriously, we'd be better off. And you, you, you just got to be yourself. Absolutely. So I um, had a chance to talk to uh, Doug Williams last night, as I mentioned on television. And we were talking, and the first thing he said is, uh, the black quarterback, I was a pocket passer, so I was, I was not going to be scrambling. Everyone knew it. No one tried to convert me because I was a quarterback, and he went right to Tampa, and he played. And he said, but he wants more black coaches. And I asked him, was it intentional? And he says, no, I don't think it's intentional. It's just we got to get more coordinators, more coaches. Do you think it's intentional? Because I get to know these owners a little, like, pretty well every year. They don't, I don't think they have a racist cell in their body. It's, it's not intentional. It's just so many of them, Brian, don't really know what it takes, and they don't know people. So um, Commissioner Goodell, he's had me talk to some owners when they're searching and, and trying to find a new coach. And my first question is always, well, what are you looking for? And they'll say, I don't really know, but just tell me who's good. And I have to say, no, wait a minute, you have to tell me what you're looking for first. Do you want a young guy? Do you want an older guy? Do you want a, you know, a player's type of coach? Do you want a disciplinarian? Do you want an offensive guy? Do you want a defensive guy? What kind guy? of roster do you have? You yeah. have an older roster? Yeah. Are you going you, you you to suck it up for two or three years yeah. and develop? You know, when I, I went to Pittsburgh, Dan Rooney, he had a, a philosophy. Hey, we're a cold-weather city. We're a blue-collar city. I want a tough defensive coach. And I'm going to pick a young guy because I don't want to do this every four or five years. He doesn't, man. So he doesn't pick. 53 years, they had three coaches. And they all started in their 30s. They were all defensive coordinators. Uh, Chuck Knoll, Bill Cower, Mike Tomlin, same guys. He had a blueprint of what he was looking for. And that's what I think so many of these owners don't have. So then it becomes, well, somebody's got to tell me who's good or I'll go right. with the – the well-known guys, and that, that's where we're missing out. So this year was about DeMar and the way the whole country rallied around this 24-year-old uh, who this 24-year-old who really died on the field and was brought back to life, and that was a celebration. And it was such a unifying feeling this year, as opposed to a couple of years ago, three years ago, four years ago, we're talking about kneeling, black league, is this a black league, white league? I feel like we've made strides as a country, and so many times we take our lead from sports. Do you? I, I saw it happen, and it, it amazed me. In 1989-90, I'm an assistant coach with the, the Chiefs. There are some players who want to pray on the field after the games. And they got together with their chaplain and said, let's do this. We got a memo from the National Football League. Don't let that happen. Take your players straight to the locker room. We can't have people praying on the field. And... Believe it or not, that actually came out. Now, fast forward to DeMar and, hey, we've got to pray. They encouraged people to come together as teams, opposite sides, the whole teams praying before the game. Uh, and it was all based on one incident. We saw a young man's life almost pass away right in front of us, and I think that changed everybody's uh, dynamics. And an ESPN anchor prayed on, on the air. On the air. So this is also a year in which Roe v. Wade got overturned. And you made it pretty clear that you thought this is a great day for America and you're pro-life. Yeah, and I understand 
if people aren't, and everybody can have their opinion. But for me and my family and my house, that's the way I see it. And I, I think we should be able to say that. And so I did, and I enjoyed it. And it was one of the most uplifting things for me that I've ever been a part of going to that march in Washington for life. And uh, now tomorrow for the NFL, uh, I was talking to the Hunt family. He says, is Tony Dungy coming? We're sticking around because we're going to see him at breakfast tomorrow. What's happening at breakfast tomorrow? There's a, an event called the Super Bowl Breakfast. It's been held for 35 years. It's actually an outreach. They know a lot of people are coming to the Super Bowl. Hey, we'll get together, come, celebrate these two teams that are here. But let's tell you what's really important in life. Share the gospel, and we're going to present the Man of the Year Award, named after Bart Starr, who was a great player, two-time MVP of the Super Bowl, but also a great man in his community. And so Kirk Cousins will be honored tomorrow. Uh, but it, it really is an event to bring people together and say there's something, as Coach Noel said, a little bit more important than just the game. And I've met Kirk Cousins, and I remember his rookie year or his second year when he's backing up uh, RG3. And I was like, this guy's a really good player. Keep an eye on him. He ends up being the quarterback of the Redskins and now what he's doing in Minnesota. But always a very religious man. Very uh, strong Christian man. He does a lot in the community. This award is voted on by the players, and it's voted on not who's the best player in the league, but who's doing the most in their community that year. And uh, they voted for Kirk Cousins, and uh, deservedly so. All right, we're going to take a short time out and come back with more Coach Dungy. You listen to the Brian Kilmeade Show in Glendale, Arizona. Don't move. Coach Tony Dungy is with us now, Pro Football Hall of Famer, obviously, for the, for the uh, Bucks and Indianapolis Colts. And um, he's uh, here because, you know, the Super Bowl's here, broadcaster, I get it. But also there's a new campaign out there that we've heard a lot of, we've seen a lot on television. In fact, I talked to uh, Steve Largent about it a couple of days ago, and you're part of it. Hashtag he gets us. Yeah, it's really a campaign just letting people know that Jesus is for everybody. And he's there and he gets us. And, and so it's been neat to be involved with people like Steve. Steve Largent was a role model of mine when I was a young player. A uh, strong Christian man, but a great player. And I saw, boy, you can do both. And, and so that's what this is kind of all about. You can use Jesus and be involved with him in whatever area of life you walk. So where did that religious fervor come from, especially when you lose your son? A lot of people would question, uh, you know, question their religion. You, From what I've observed, it seems that you're more spiritual than ever. Well, for me, it came from my parents and a, a great background coming up. But then when I got to the Steelers as a rookie, 21-year-old, um, there were about 15 guys on the team that were just strong, solid Christians. I ended up being roommates with Donnie Shell, who uh, just taught me how to be a man and taught me that there's more to life than just, just this sport. So uh, I think I owe it to my Steeler teammates. They, they're the ones that kind of grounded me. While winning and being the toughest, meanest <laughs> yeah. football team, yeah. that this fearsome group was also had this soft side. Just strong, strong uh, inner character, and that, that's what people didn't see. And I, I didn't see it. I got there, and I'm thinking, just like you, steel curtain, tough guys, bad guys, great football players. But it was more than that. I mean, great family men, community service, uh, just showing you what life was all about. So you had a chance to coach Peyton Manning. I did. Uh how much of his success was due to raw skill, and how much was it raw passion for the game? He was very talented, obviously, but the most dedicated player I've ever been around. A hundred percent trying to be the best that he could be, leave no stone unturned, help his teammates, uh, be a leader for everybody. Um, he, he just was the, the best practice player, hardest worker, most prepared guy, and that, that's why he was good. I'll give you a story, Brian. My last year coaching, we've already won a Super Bowl. He's been a three-time MVP. We draft a young receiver from Ohio State, Anthony Gonzalez, because of Ohio State's class schedule. He can't come in May and June with us because he's still in school. Peyton, on his own, drove two days a week from Indianapolis, drove his car to Ohio State's campus, took the playbook, went over with Anthony, threw balls for an hour, and then drove back eight hours twice a week to help a young rookie receiver. And now we hear Arch Manning is going to <laughs> Texas, and now I'm watching his son throw the ball yeah. on the field. I mean, what's going on with that family? Peyton told me Arch is going to be the Cooper's best son. 
quarterback of all the Mannings. Yes, this young Peyton's nephew. And he's better than Eli, better than Peyton at that year, better than Archie. <laughs> so, wow. But Archie's so different from both his sons, right? Yeah. Remember Archie yeah. was a run? You play with him. Athletic. He was run yeah. first guy, yeah. him and Tarkington with he, these scramblers. Super athletic. Uh, but I'll tell you what they took from Archie, Peyton and Eli, that competitive spirit, that drive, and that determination, and just being good people. I, I listened to him call into Tom Brady's podcast with Jim Gray. And they just talked about the rivalry and respect they had for each other. Is that real? It is. People think that, you know, they hated each other and, you know, all of that. The most respect for each other always talked off the field. Peyton would come in, hey, I talked to Tom. They did this against this team, and we ought to try it. I mean, they, they had that type of relationship where they, they really respected each other. But Pey Peyton Manning coming out of college, everyone knew he was going to be great, which is how great, him or Ryan Leaf. Uh, and I know Ryan Leaf didn't pan out, but nobody thought Brady was going to be great. I've never seen anybody be so great and be so underappreciated coming out. Can you, did you, can you wrap your head around it with all the talent you've evaluated? Yeah, you know, he split time in college, with wasn't Greasy a full-time starter. Henson. Yeah, and so you didn't get to see everything. They played in a running conference and the running Big Ten at that time, and I don't think people, and he's another one, the, the preparation, the, the work ethic, the determination, competitiveness, that's what's hard to measure. And that's what people didn't see until he got to New England. Well, obviously, yeah, and then he hit the right coach at the right yeah. time, and there's obviously more respect there. Looking at these two guys, I get the sense that Hurts and Mahomes could have the same thing. Very similar. Very similar guys who are very determined. They've got great coaches. They've got good systems. But... Uh, they have a passion for the game, and they want to win, and it rubs off on their teammates. When Hertz was told to sit at Alabama after starting, and then he sits and then goes to Oklahoma, that's character. Yeah. The NBA didn't complain, didn't, for the didn't say, hey, you know, I got screwed. No, hey, I'll go somewhere else, and I'll show you what I can do. Oh, So, Coach, finally, hashtag he, uh, he gets us, and the other big message that you're taking away from uh, tomorrow's breakfast, the Bart Star Award is that there's more to life than football. Super Bowl is a great experience, but it's not the most important thing. Uh, come to the breakfast and find out what's the most important thing in You life. enjoying the broadcasting? Loving it. NBC's been great. Wow. Too bad we can't get you at Fox. I'm going to see what I can do. <laughs> I'll represent you. Let's we'll see more of Tony Dungy. Uh, Coach, always great talking to you. you. Brian. It's Good a to privilege. be with you. Brian Kilmeade Show, live from Super Bowl 57. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.